Okay, this is uh, part one of the uh, practice exam. So I'm going to solve some of these problems. I might make another video solving the other ones if I run out of time. I have a meeting coming up. Um, so I'm going to try to go through these one at a time, and I pre-wrote a couple of them already. So uh, like I said, this practice exam is not comprehensive. It doesn't cover all of the material that we have covered. It's just to give you an idea of what sorts of questions and really the way that I will ask these questions on the actual exam as usual. Um, so I definitely don't recommend that you use this as your end-all be-all study tool. You should use the practice exam in conjunction with using the read, study, and practice um, page on uh, Wiley Plus or looking through the book, looking through previous lectures and doing practice problems that way. Okay, so we'll start with question one. Uh, the first question here says uh, to, in our own words, explain the difference between a definite and an indefinite integral. Okay, so here's a sample response that I would, I would probably like to get from you guys. Could say something like a definite integral has bounds of integration and results in a number integral a to b f of x dx equals some number and uh, an indefinite integral represents the class of functions which are antiderivatives of Uh, f of x. So for example, integral f of x dx equals capital F of x plus c. Okay, so the difference between an indefinite integral and a definite integral is a definite integral. When we evaluate it, we will get a definite number. And when we compute an indefinite integral, we will be left with a class of functions. And this is just the way that we have defined these two notations. Okay, so the next question is, does every continuous function f of x have a unique antiderivative? In your own words, explain why or why not. Well, the answer is no, uh, and here's an example. We can have two functions. If we take some function which is an antiderivative of the function we're interested in, and we add some number to it, which in my case I just added c. So c here is just some number. And uh, if we do this um, addition here and we take the derivative, well, when we do the derivative of a constant, it's just going to be 0. So for example, uh, the antiderivative of x squared could be, um, well, let's make it 3x squared, could be x cubed, or it could be x cubed minus 7. Both of these things, if we do their derivative, we will get 3x squared, and on the other one, we'll get 3x squared plus 0. So that's why the antiderivative is not unique. However, if we had an additional piece of information, such as some something like f of 0 equals 17, some additional thing, we call this an addition, uh, initial condition, or an initial value, um, then we can find a unique antiderivative. Okay, so in my own words, explain why or why not. Um, well, we can have multiple functions which are the antiderivative, so that kind of contradicts the word unique. Unique means there's only one. Okay, question two. We're supposed to take these uh, things here and decide whether we think that they represent a number or a class of functions. So f of 25, we plug a number into a function. A function is an operation which takes a number as an input, and the output is a number. 
takes numbers as inputs and it outputs a different number or the same number. So if we do f of 25, we're going to get a number. Uh, you can also read this in the question. It says f and g are continuous real valued functions, meaning if we plug something in, we're going to get a real number out. So out pops some real number. All right. Part B, we see we have the indefinite integral of f of x dx. I just defined in uh, the first problem that the indefinite integral is going to give us a class of functions. So this is going to be a class of functions or a family. All right, next up for um, this part, capital F of B minus capital F of A. Well, in the problem, we said that a and B are real numbers, and f of x, capital F of x, and capital G of x are antiderivatives of f and g respectively. So we don't know which antiderivative they are, but they are one of those antiderivatives. So in particular, if little f of x and little g of x are continuous real valued functions, capital F of X and capital G of X will be real valued functions, uh, which are functions which just take a real number, take a number as input, and give a number as output. So since B and A are numbers, and we plug them into a function, which gives numbers as an output, this looks like a number minus a number equals a number. Okay. We could also have rewritten this as the integral from A to B of f of x dx. And this equality sign follows from the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, next up we have uh, the integral from 0 to 1 of g of x dx. Well, this is a definite integral. Um, we know that g of x is a continuous real valued function, so if we take its definite integral, we are going to get a number. Okay, uh, indefinite integral of 7dx, we already know it's going to be a class of functions because it's an indefinite integral. We can even say what the class of functions is. If we anti-differentiate 7, we will get 7x and we'll add c. So 7x plus c, that's a class of functions. It is the collection of all functions which have the form 7x plus some number. So altogether, this is a class of functions. All right. Capital F of g of 2 is taking a number and plugging it into a function. When we plug 2 into capital G, we're going to get out a number. And then we're going to take that number and plug it into the function capital F. And we're going to get a number. All right, last one is the most complicated looking thing. Well, we have some function here. And we're integrating, and we're doing a definite integral from 2a to 2b. And remember, a and b are themselves numbers. So if we take the integral from some number to some number of some function, we're doing a definite integral. And that's going to give us the area under this kooky looking function here, um, which is going to give us a number. Okay, so uh, general rule of thumb, if we have uh, bounds of integration, like 2a and 7b, or like 0 and 1, we're doing a definite integral, or like in c, going from a to b, these are going to be definite integrals, and the result of a definite integral problem is a definite number. Okay. 
So the next question here is asking us to do some Riemann sums. So I did a little bit of calculation before I started this, but um, I'll kind of draw what I'm going to do here. So, in fact, I think I flip-flopped these. All right, so we want to use a right-hand Riemann sum with three rectangles, okay? So n equals 3. And if n equals 3, we know that delta x is going to be b minus a over n, which in our case, our interval goes from a to b, where a is going to be 1 and b is going to be 10. So this will be 10 minus 1 divided by 3. It's 9 divided by 3 is 3. So the width of each rectangle should be 3, because the length of our interval is 9 units long, and we want to use 3 rectangles to divide that up. So let me just draw that in on our picture here. 1, 2, 3. There's our first one, and then the second one. 1, 2, 3. And then the last one. 1, 2, 3. So these will be our widths of our rectangles. Okay, and now if we want to do a Riemann sum, the only thing left to do is to pick the heights of our rectangles, and then um, we just want to calculate the area of the rectangles, and that will give us our estimate for the area under the curve. So in the first problem, we're asked to use a right-hand sum, right-hand Riemann sum, which means that the height of the rectangle in each interval should be the height of the function on the right-hand side of the interval. So the first interval is this interval from 1 to 4 here, and we should choose the height to to be the height of the function on the right side of the interval. That's what it means to do a right-hand sum. And then again, here we'll go to 7. And lastly, we will take the height on the far right of the last interval. So this is to do a right-hand sum. So what are these heights? Well, if I am looking at the height of my first rectangle, which I'll highlight in red here, the height of that rectangle is going to be the height of the function at the point where x is equal to 4. So I'm going to take the number 4, and I'm going to plug it in to the function f of x. The width is 3 for each of these, and the height of the first one is going to be f of 4, the height of the second one will be f of 7, the height of the third one will be f of 10. So if we want to add up these rectangles area, it will be 3 times f of 4 plus f of 7 plus f of 10. And I wrote the 3 out front because since each of these three things will be multiplied by 3, I just took out the GCF. Um, so if I were to go ahead and take the number 4 and plug it into the function f of x equals 3x squared plus 2x plus 3, I'm going to get 59. So I get 3 times 59 plus... Oops. 59 plus, now I'll plug in 7, I get 164, 164, and then I'll add to that. When I plug in 10, I'll get 323. If I add those numbers and multiply by 3, I think I get um, 1638. Let's just check that really quick and make sure I did that math right. 3 times 59 plus 
164 plus 3, we get 1638. Great. So 1638 is the cumulative area of each of these red rectangles added together. Okay, so I just needed to take the width of each rectangle, which was 3, and multiply that times the height of each rectangle, which in our case for the right-hand sum were the values f of 4, f of 7, and f of 10. The left-hand sum is similar. We're going to take 3 times, and instead of the heights of the rectangles being the height of the function on the right side of each interval, we're going to take the heights to be the height of the function on the left side of each interval. Maybe I'll use a, I'll use blue. We're going to extend these over just like this. So the height of the first function or the first rectangle will be the height of the function when x is equal to 1. And then f of 4 will apply to the height of this second rectangle, and f of 7 will apply to the height of the third rectangle. So we'll have 3, that's the width of each rectangle, and inside here I'm going to put f of 1 plus f of 4 plus f of 7. And if I add all those up from my table here, this was the table that I pre-calculated. It's just me plugging in these x values into the function f of x. I take those values there, I'll get 3 times uh, 8 plus 59 plus 164. And I believe if you multiply that out, you get 693. So this is how we do Riemann sums. Uh, we just, it's really just adding up the area of rectangles. And the tricky part is choosing how wide and how tall should each rectangle be. Okay. The last part, they ask us to use the fundamental theorem of calculus to do it. Well, if we do that, we just wanna integrate the function 3x squared plus 2x plus 3 over the interval from 1 to 10. So we find an antiderivative, integrate, uh, find the antiderivative of 3x squared, that's x cubed, and then we add to that the antiderivative of um, 2x, that's x squared, and then the antiderivative of 3 is going to be 3x, and then we evaluate at 10 and 1. So we plug in, plug in, subtract, and we get 1125. So that represents the true area under the curve. Maybe I'll, I'll highlight it in blue, and on the picture, I'll draw it in blue. It's the actual area under the curve here. True area. And the final question for this part is to, is to ask us uh, which of the answers A and B are a better estimate. So is A or B more accurate? And well, we just have to compare. I know that the true value is 1125. So I need to decide is 1638 or 693 closer to 1125, the true area under the curve. And I believe that uh, 1638 is going to be closer. It's going to be like 500 away. Is that right? No, that's not right. 693 is closer.
Okay. So in our case, the left hand dream ensemble. is more accurate. That won't always be true. Sometimes the right hand sum will be more accurate. Okay, and uh, I'll be back in the next video to solve the remaining problems on the practice exam.